prognosis, they don't know. They, you know, they, they're basically giving me two years at best you know, to live. That's when you're sitting down there, you know, and I'm what, 19? Sitting down at the table and it's like, son, you need to take care of your mom. You know, and like, how do you process that? You know, like, and so he's telling me this in May of 1999. And by September, this, this month, September 30th, he died. So, Telling me, you know, you got two years and then within a matter of like four or five months, he's gone. And that was really disruptive, you know, for me as a student. I'm like, I didn't know what to do, you know. And so it, it, it and I still, you know, amazingly, you know, finished on time here. I was just so disoriented, you know, it was hard to focus on anything. And I have professors that were just nasty about it. In the business school, I, had a, I have professors in business school was nasty. I had professors in my like philosophy classes. Like I miss, I was missing exams. They were like, they wouldn't even let me make it up, even though I was at the funeral. Her philosophy professor told me he's like, well, you know, people die. At least you got school to take your mind off of it. I was like, why? Like I just told you, my father died. That was your response. Is that person still working? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if they do or not. I don't even remember what his name was. Had the same thing. I called. I was sitting in the hospital parking lot. The day my father died, and I called, uh, I sent an email or something like that to the professor in the business school, and he didn't even really read the email, and he was just like, "Yeah, I'm sorry about your granddad, but this work is still do." And I and I, and I remember calling him, and we're like, first of all, man, I didn't tell you my grandfather died; I told you my dad died." Yeah. I'm like, "You out of pocket for this, man?" And I was like, "Went in on yeah. this professor." You know, he relented. He was like, I'm so sorry, you know, but, you know, students always do this and they always call and talk about somebody died. I make excuses. Man. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it was, yeah, it was, it was a lot to try to, to negotiate and navigate you know, as a student. That was a long kind of story that went off course, but so that was the biggest thing that I felt like that was an obstacle for me yeah. here outside of, you know, the things in the school that I was in. That happened, you said you were, you know, you turned 19? Yeah, I was 19 at that point. Okay. Like he, he died when I was, I was 20 by the time he died. So, the junior, what was coping like by doing undergrad and into your master's program? Yep. What did coping look like for you? Dealing with the, first off, that, the, the loss, but then the anger from yeah. still having to go to class every day and see yeah. the professor or reflections of how you were treated by one professor. Maybe in a different person. What was coping? Yeah, I mean, because we ain't taught that, right? I mean, even my father was in a particular kind of generation where I taught you we were close, yeah. right? He's coach, but my father was not the kind of dude that's gonna be like hugging on you and son, I love you. Don't, we didn't get none of that. It was none of the emotional side of it, right? That I, I really try to be very intentional about with my son now. That's a different. Conversations, but we didn't have that. So it was just like the things that you would just keep inside. So then, you know, I, I will go, I will go, I'm glad you're here. I will go to the counseling center. Um, it's funny because my relationship with the counseling center started when I first got here when I was online, yeah. but I was pledging capital. Um, the counseling center became a good excuse <laughs> to not have to be getting hazed, right? Yeah, sure. Well, I, I can't be upset because I got counseling today. Right, and so you can sneak off to the counseling center and just be there, and you know the 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 person who Dr. Adams at that point who was a professor he um, is now a development, you know, would just because she knew she was an AKA, so she would just allow you know, but but that meant that I had established a relationship with the counseling center that then when he passed, I still had access to that. Right. I could go process that, but we still, as you know, we stigmatize that. We don't want to go to counseling. We don't, you know, but that was really helpful. And I, I didn't, I, I probably never went to counseling again after that time until I was a grad student at Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. And it was really, really interesting because other doctoral students, PhD students, especially people of color and black folks, is like, hey man, the first thing that you need to do when you get on this campus at, at this elite PWI is, is go get you some counseling. Yeah. I don't know, ain't nothing have to happen. I know you got to be wrong. You just need to establish a relationship with the counselors. So that, that, was, that was really good, but that was important. Then um, I had that, but 
Otherwise, it was just, you know, just finding your way. Yeah. Just finding your way and try to figure it out, you know, the best way that you could. But it, it wasn't. Because it was, it came at a critical moment, right? Mm-hmm. It, it, it's like 1920. You, you, you on the cusp of manhood, but you ain't a man yet. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Years. Huh? Got a few years. You got some years. And, and, and it's like, even legally, you ain't even legal, right? I mean, I, I remember sitting, it, it was, it was at my 20th birthday and he, he was in chemo and all of that. And I remember he was just so tired because the chemo had drained him. He was like, I'm sorry, son. I can't do nothing for your birthday. He's like, we're going to make it up on a big birthday for you on your 21st. Yeah. You know, of course, that never happened. But even to turning 21 was this kind of, you know, this mark of, of, of rites of passage in, in terms of manhood. But I enter into that early period of manhood without the example of, of fatherhood and manhood that I needed then. You know what I mean? And, and, and so it, it always felt like, I mean, this was true just growing up into manhood. It was true academically that I was always just kind of on this scavenger hunt. I was doing this on my own, looking for a mentor here or a mentor there or some advice here or that because I never really had it like that yeah. but I would you know I would get it where I could and where I ne- needed it so people like Dr. Jones were important along the way you know people like oh, but but I always just felt like I was searching for that that I didn't have because that guiding light or north star was snatched out of my life right. you know at that critical point where I was just trying to figure out like because because I, I even think about it now is like you have, if you've got your dad in your life, you have certain kinds of conversations with him as a young person, like as a kid or as a, even as a teenager. But like, I just, you know, like I admire men that I know that it, that as grown men and as fathers themselves have their fathers still to talk to. Yeah. Like, hey dad, you know, as a man now, what, what was it like doing this or how do you, you know, I never had that. And I've always wondered what that would be like to be able to talk to my father as a grown man. Yeah. And I just never had it. You know, and, and I, I always feel like that that's kind of a crucial missing piece yeah. that it could never get back. And so that's why, you know, even as I have conversations with a lot of young brothers who never had a father, you know what I'm saying? Like, I can't relate to that. But I can relate to what it means to have a, to not have a father when you really was trying to come into manhood and need. Yeah. You know what I mean? Most definitely. Definitely. I want to say we'll take a break. We'll be right back. I feel a, a fraud. It got too heavy, didn't it? Yeah. But uh, we ain't going to be right back because this ain't NBC or whatever <laughs> over used to come on. But you, you touched on something really critical um, in the passing of the unfortunate passing of your, your father taking place uh, on the cusp of manhood. Academically speaking, that junior year, that's where, you know, we're supposed to be looking at master's programs or if we're going to move across the country and get into the workforce or across the world, get into the workforce. Um, also, this is right before, I'll put a link in here for some of our younger audience members. This is around the time of Y2K. So what's going to happen with computers and technology? Is the world going to explode? The stock market is going to crash, right? Is my watch still going to work in the morning? A lot of uncertainty time. And you were like, your life was embodying that in September of, of uh, was 2099. 99, exactly. So, yeah. so, uh, so you, you, you sneak dated me. I did, I guess I did it to myself. Did to myself. You know, they were like, I'm like, hey, bro, you, you all here, yeah, bro. They did it to myself. Yeah. Black on crack, though. <laughs> but during, during this time, um, you're, you're grieving and coping and still grinding, you're moving forward. Um, and you were given some gems in grad school that you listened to yeah. and went and continued to seek that, that help that you uh, maybe you didn't need it that day, yeah. but, but you definitely needed it. Um, the, some of that, that section of the conversation. But what I want to dig into a little bit, talked about um, having a missing piece mm-hmm. as, a, as a black man coming of age. Yeah. Um, when you get to uh, the point where it's like, okay, I'm going to finish your bill, figure that out. What's the next thing? Figure out the master's program, okay, PhD, what's, what's the next thing? What were some conversations like with people that you were having as you were figuring out the next thing by your father's absence? Yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. I mean, I, I, 
you know, I've always stayed in close contact with, with Dr. Jones. So we've had, you know, lots of conversations over the years that have been. But like even to 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 to, to go back to that, and we were actually talking about this earlier today, which is an iteration of this. Mm-hmm. When I was undergrad, they had something called black male rap sessions. They called it beamers. Right, and so they would be big groups of undergrads would come in and just talk about whatever you know topic was important in the culture at the moment, or just things specific to black men. At that point, a, a brother named Ed Laxter ran that program, so Ed was always really good at having those conversations. I stayed in contact with him and, and some other folks, you know, who could help. You know, I, I don't remember anything that was just earth shattering or groundbreaking that was just like, oh. Now that's when the aha moment happened or the light went on that I knew what I needed to do next. You know, I was just having, you know, conversation. I, I think when I left here, because that's another chapter of life, it's, it's a whole other story. You know, I left here and went to, to seminary. This is kind of church and ministerial phase. And but I went to a seminary that was, was, was deeply problematic. I stayed here in the city and went to the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. All the story, if you don't know about that, it's a very conservative place, right? And how I ended up there is a whole other conversation. Like, how do you leave campus that end up in Southern Baptist Theological Seminary? Another story for another day. But in that space, it was a whole other kind of wilderness and very white and toxic space. Um, that, but, but during that time, I always knew that I still wanted to go on and do PhD work. So I started looking out from there to Vanderbilt, which is another elite white space, but they had so many black faculty in their graduate department of religion. And that's what I really wanted to get to. And so I started just cold calling and cold emailing people, just yeah. like, hey, man, I'm interested in this program. And I had a brother named Brad Braxton. Brad, Dr. Braxton, he, he would respond to my emails that he didn't have to, and he would have some really, really intentional conversations like, brother, if you want to get here, this is what you're going to need to do. This is how this game works, you know, and it is a game, and you got to learn the game. And you need to know this is how the GRE works, and this is how it matters at Vanderbilt. Do whatever you got to do, invest in whatever classes you got to to make sure you got a strong GRE score. If you want to be able to get here, here's this. I'm going to send you my application packet from when I applied to graduate school so you can read it, model it after that. Right. I mean, it were just these things that they was like, man, that's super helpful because otherwise I would have had no idea how you get from here to there. You could say, oh, I want to go get a Ph.D., but if nobody ever tells you this is the game, this is the entrance process, this is what they value, this is what you got to have, this is the language they speak. Right. I know what you're interested in, but don't say that, say this, right. you know, because this is the language that they hear mm-hmm. and that they respond to. And it was just people like that that would put you up on this game. And then another brother. You know, um, and this is interesting, and this gets into our understanding of the black manhood and so on and so forth. There's another brother named Victor Anderson. And Victor was, uh, and, and remains to this day, has been a godsend. But, you know, when I was here, you know, people would be like, oh, you got to watch out because, you know, the brother down in Gang- Vanderbilt, they'd be gay, it's be the LGBTQ, this and that, you know, and you got to watch out. So they claim he's kind of homophobic feet. Yeah. And look, if it was for that gay black man, Victor Anderson, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? When, because when I, I went to Vanderbilt to work with Brad, Brad left after my first year there. Okay? And if you never know, if you've been in a graduate program or a PhD program, if your advisor leaves and you ain't got nobody advising you, you can get left in the, in the wind and nobody picks you up. You may not finish. And I was also already working with Victor, but as like in a minor, in, a, in, a, in a, another role. Victor was like, I am not going to let you fall through the cracks. You know, I got you. You're going to be like my adopted son here. Victor looked out for me. Victor would have me at his house. He would take me to the bar. He would take me all these places again and just invest. You know, you need to read this. You need to read that. You need to read. If you really want to be able to do this, that, and third, you need to do that. And I mean, I owe so much of how I got here, not just Dr. Jones here in that foundation, but Victor Anderson, you know, and, and Victor, you know, taught me so much and has been so influential. And I remain into, in con- conversation with Victor to this day. Yeah. We were just back in Nashville last week, my wife and I, 
they, we, we stayed in Victor's house, you know, and he's still dropping knowledge on us. And so, you know, I just have people who are willing to look out and just really just kind of explain the game. Yeah. Um, and I appreciated that. I mean, it didn't make up for not having your father. Right. But you have some black men cross, you know, you know, sexual identities, whatever, who were just like, because I, I'm trying to see you succeed as another black man. I appreciate yeah. that. But I, what I get from that, uh, so you have people in your life who you lose, you lose coach, your yep. first coach, yep. um, but you stayed in the game and you were given some guys in the other coaches. Mm-hmm. If you go from A to B, mm-hmm. right? I don't know if I'm, if you go from A to okay. B. Okay. And regardless of their identities, not being Kentuckians, not being you know, uh, kin to the University of Louisville right. in any way. They still poured into you things, planted seeds in you that you've been planting, replanting yeah. in students now yeah. at the University of Louisville. Y'all give a hand for this doctor right here. If y'all ain't never had him before uh, or, or met him, how let him you see him in, in, in passing. Um, and he's giving a lot of gems today. We ain't done. But he's giving you a lot of gems today as far as how to proceed on a path of your path, your personal path of greatness, your personal path of success. Heeding to good wisdom. Somebody give you a good idea, just see it through. Just look into it. Okay, they say go counsel, but I'm here. Let me just pop in. Questioning certain things, questioning wisdom. Right? Sometimes things about wisdom, we may it may be correct, but we may, may not be ready for. And then sometimes people just be wrong. Sometimes our people just be wrong. Right? So, oh, watch out for this brother over here. But years later, that brother's family now, right? With, with Brother Anderson. Um, and seeking out people who can be your champions and allowing allowing them to be your champions, right? For the, us staff members that's in the room, uh, y'all get communication from us. We ain't just doing it just because we we bored and just want to send you something. Like we 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 real be having things for you all. You know what I mean? So a lot of people who want to be your champions, a lot of them be your corner men, your coaches, your corner women, your coaches, and a lot of them to be your your champions. And sometimes at certain ages and seasons of life, people can see things in us that we don't even think are possible in ourselves. Um. So people gave you the run around. And, and sometimes that's going to be negative stuff, too. So people in business college and the speed school, they gave you the run around and, and treated you, um, uh, I can't curse, but it treated you in a very inequitable fashion. And so now on the other side of things, now as a professor, um, a researcher at R1 University, now, A, you know what prejudice looks like and right. feels like as a student. Right. Um, at a, at a PWI, at a grad student, as a grad student, at an even bigger, more prestigious PWI, um, how do those interactions impact how you work with your students today? Oh, absolutely informative. Because I can, you know, literally say to folks in my classroom, I sat in these exact same seats. Right, that you did. Literally, I know they did because over in Davidson and Strickland, they ain't, they ain't changed these seats. They ain't spent no money um, <laughs> to update them. You know what I mean? We still got the same talk boards and all that. Like I said, exact. So, so I understand it. And then some of these experiences that you're having, they haven't changed. You know, when when I came into Jones's classroom, he was the first black male professor I ever had, or teacher really. You know, I had a I had a brother who was an African immigrant as my computer teacher in um in high school. But in terms of a black American male teacher, never had that until like I said, and so many people I talk to now, same thing. You know, I'm, I'm the first one that they've had. And I'm like, that's crazy in 2022 that that's still the experience. So we share that. But then just the kind of things that they're going through, I try to be really sensitive to that, you know, um, because it, even when I come into class, like in the first five, 10 minutes of class, we didn't even talk about anything academic. Like, how y'all doing? How was your weekend? Know what's going on with you? I'm like, hey man, your whole your whole body, your whole disposition look off. You're like, what's going on with you? You know, like I was we in class a couple of weeks ago, assisting the class, 
I'm like, what's, I'm like, how y'all do it? I was, I was like, sis, when I said that, your, your, your body slumped. Why? You know, like, what's going on? And then she started talking. I'm like, where are you from? And I was, she's like, I'm, I'm from Florida. I'm like, oh, you homesick. Miss your people. I was like, listen, I want everybody in this class to hear this. I'm like, because when you see her out on campus or in the sack of somebody, check in on her. Yeah. You know what I mean? We can't learn together if we ain't got our needs met. You know what I'm saying? If we out here missing our folks and our people. I'm like, we got to be community for her in this class because we don't know what she's going through outside of when she's not with us. So this ain't just about the intellectual piece. You know, the intellectual, that's why I always always have a problem, and I, and I get it, when as academics we talk about, we value the life of the mind, right? We use that as a metaphor for being intellectually inclined. I'm like, it's not the life of the mind, as if my mind is somehow abstracted from the rest of my body, and my body is from, abstracted from my social life and my community. Like, all of this is part, I'm an embodied person within community. So my intellectual life is part of this other sociality, you know? Like, we can't, you know, we know this because my wife is a, is a, is a elementary teacher. Yeah. If you got kids that's coming in, they ain't had no breakfast, they ain't had nothing to eat, they had, you cannot expect them to sit down and, and learn. That's why, and this comes from the Black Panther program, right? From when they were giving community uh, breakfast to the, to the to the kids, that you know, Head Start programs and other, were having the free breakfast for kids that are coming in because you know you gotta feed these kids because your mind need nutrition. If I'm if I'm hungry, I don't have my my brain doesn't have what it needs. In the same way, man, if we don't have what we need in the classroom. You know, before we start talking about ideas, like what's going on with y'all? How y'all feeling? I remember when Kobe died. You All know, right. we just had a whole. I like, hey, how y'all processing this? But we're gonna just take the first twenty minutes of class, just talk like, what does it say to you about your own mortality? Yeah. You know what I mean? Because we think about these folks being invincible and we're gonna live forever. But now when you really start thinking about it, like, not just Kobe, but Gigi gone. How is that impacting you? What does that even mean for how you learning today? You know what I mean? And, and so, so many people have come to my office after class, and, and, you know, and I ain't no counselor, you know, I didn't direct them over to the counseling <laughs> right. center, but right. you know, we, we haven't had those conversations offline. Yeah. Because the people were like, you're the first professor that ever asked me about X, Y, and Z. You know, I was in a car accident, you know, however many years ago, and I think I got a brain injury. You know, I can't really process it because the, 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 the student failed the class, the, the, the exam so badly. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, it's one thing to get an F, you know, because of what, 50 something F. Yeah. You get a 14. I'm, I'm like, going I'm going I'm like, hey, let me holler at you about your class. You know, and of course, the students feel shamed and embarrassed. I'm like, nah, this ain't about that. I'm like, what's going on? Talk to me about this, you know, and this is like the first time anybody ever asked me this. And now we have, I'm like, look, you, look, you have to go get this checked out, yeah. you know, and, you know, and, and we have a long conversation at that point, but I just try to be as empathetic as I can to that. Now, at the same time, <laughs> at the same time, bro, because you know us, you know, because before I started professing, I, I worked in high schools here. So I worked at Western High School. And I worked essential, mm -hmm. you know. And as soon as the young brothers, you know, they see, ah, what's up, man? We about to chill. We about to chill. Yeah. I know you the am like, <laughs> nah, bro. You're going to work. You're going to read. And you might fail this class. You know, you come in here playing, you're going to yeah. fail. You know, but you're balancing that. Yeah. But, but but even that is saying, because I'm demanding this out of you, because I believe in us. Yeah. I believe, in, and I teach black studies. Where else are you going to get this? Who else is going to teach you about us? Yeah. Who else is going to tell you this information? Yeah, we're going to read three, four books in here because who else want to sign them? You know what I mean? If we have black people all over the campus and professors everywhere, then I can expect, but you're not going to get this everywhere else. Now, I, I kind of chilled out on some of that. Mm. But the expectation is one, because the subject matter is important, and two, because I believe y'all smart enough to get this. Mm. Y'all smart as anybody I know sitting in these classes in Vanderbilt. Yeah. You know what I mean? You ain't necessarily had the resources that they had to get here or the, the kind of communal support, but you got it innately in you to be that. 
And if you want to leave here and go there for graduate school, you can get there. And this is how you do it. Just like Brad Braxton told me, this is how you do it. Let me put you up on game. Right on. But you got to be committed to doing that work. And don't be coming in here just BSing me because we both black and you think we're going to chill. Right. So it's that balance in between yeah. not being the professor who told me, oh, at least you got something to fall back on when your dad is on. That's, you know, that's completely cold and just, I mean, that's hard. That's evil. You know what I mean? I would never be that professor. Yeah. But at the same time, don't come in here telling me about, you know, some, some whatever, because you think you're going to play on some black empathy. This going right. to make me let you off the hook for, for demanding the best out of you. On, on that note, got a, a question for you. On a yeah. similar note, as far as uh, abiding by a, a great playbook to, to further your, your education. Um, so we got a question here that says, you mentioned how there is certain language needed to get into these programs when you are applying. Yeah. Now that you are a professor, how do you counteract the narrative of fitting a mm. mold to be a professor or academic and diversifying the field? Yeah, I mean, that, I, that's always, yeah, that's interesting. It's a helpful question. I appreciate that. I think Both sets of language games are important and valuable. I think we know best, we do best and thrive best when we know them both. Mm -hmm. And we're fluent yeah. in them both, right? You know. <laughs> code switch. Code switching, but not necessarily having the code switch. Mm -hmm. You know, code messing, as it, as it were. You know, because we can be having a conversation and I'm talking philosophically with you about Dairy Die and all these other you know, philosophers. And I'm also talking to you about LeBay in the same conversation. But you gotta respect both. Yeah. You know, and, and in fact it shows your cultural incompetency for not knowing about Lil Bay. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? When I also know about the, the, the white people who you think are the, the, the intellectuals that we're supposed to know. Right. You know what I mean? And so but but I think the the the, the more that you can master both sets of these languages, the more flexible and ambidextrous you can become yeah. because no one can ever dismiss you right for not being a real scholar or a real intellectual and i, I think there's real value in coming in and changing the game and then just saying like okay i'm gonna write like i want to mm -hmm. but always know that i got this back here you know but sometimes i think we come in and we just we, we just want to engage in the kind of um cultural knowledge mm -hmm. really not behind it. You know what I mean? Yeah. This is why I always respect yeah. people like, you know, when I, with the public intellectuals of the day, when I was coming through, that was Cornell West, that was Michael Eric Dyson, that was now the late Bell Hooks. Mm -hmm. They were changing the academic game at that moment as black public intellectuals who were speaking the vernacular of the people, especially Michael Eric Dyson. Yeah. You know, would, I mean, he was the hip hop scholar who was yeah. quoting Biggie and Pac and, you know, dropping it and just, Every people were like, oh man, he was like, I want to make the, the life of the mind, use that phrase, you know, sex, you know what I mean? And he did. But when when you press, he could take it there to these other philosophical traditions. Cornell, same. Bell Hooks, same. You know, but then when that became in vogue, you have people who were looking at their public performance of the of the information and not recognizing what was behind it. So they just wanted the, the rhetorical flair. Right? But they weren't, they weren't going to sit down with books long enough to read this really dense material to get the depth, you know, that you got the well to draw on to rip. Yeah. That's like when you talk about the jazz musician. It's not that they just show up and start playing. They've been doing these scores and, you know, these, these scales for a long time. And then they come in and they'd they be like, oh, man, that was amazing. But then, but they can actually play. You know, they can actually read the music on the sheet. You know, they... So they got the foundation. So I, I, I really think you got to be able to do both. But and, and, and when you do it right, you know what I'm saying, you got to make folks recognize that when I do it right, it, it actually lets you know that those foundational sources that you thought was so critical ain't really all that, you know what I'm saying, in the first place. I know them, but I know them well enough to expose them to say that there's a million black thinkers over here that have said something just as profound or if not more. And a number of organic intellectuals that ain't never been through nobody's school, like James Baldwin, right? Who can drop knowledge with the best of them? 
a wide I feel scope. Like I got going over it's, time. It's Get out of the. Nah, you good. You ain't, you ain't been over no time. We 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 rapping. You remember you did the, the living room talk with with uh with Anna Drake and uh, uh-huh. yeah, yeah, yeah 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 oh Sunny Sunny yeah. Sonny, Sonny. Yeah. Sonny. Oh, that's that sister. Really? Yeah man. Really? So these are two uh, outstanding poets of our time. Uh, I'll put a link to the, the information in our description. Uh, this is on YouTube. Um, if y'all have any questions at all for, for this this scholar in front of you, uh, this that's just one. It's a lot of asking. You come with a lot of asking. <laughs> a lot of asking. Any any questions about anything? <coughs> so when is next play? When it what's his office hours? Maybe you just want hours. But even tacking onto that last thing. Like, you know, I like, like knowing that language and then showing up with a big gold Africa earring and a tattoo, you know, sleeve of tattoos already is a disruptive in the space. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I'm going to show up with all this and then drop on you yeah. the intellectual, you know, half that you can't just dismiss because uh-huh. you might just see me and think one thing, mm-hmm. you know. And I'm also very intentional about showing up in this space yeah. like, like this right. because now the next brother you see tatted up, you can't just dismiss because you don't know. Right. You know, if he's as articulate as I am, if you, right. if you just judge that, you, what you think about me before I open my mouth. Yeah. Right. And so what do you think about, you know, I mean, it, yeah. so that's all part of the the intentionality of showing up fully who I am. Mm-hmm. In every know, room. Fully who I am. Now, I contain multitudes. You, you know. says a lot of adjectives. I know one thing. You go. I'm complex. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So the side of me that you might get in any one moment might be different but it's all part of me because i got multiple parts of myself to which to, to, to draw absolutely. absolutely that's me yeah. all uh brother Rand, what's up good afternoon uh, i got a question for you yes sir so you have a lot of roles yeah too many how do you handle uh, implied anxiety It's it, it it's a lot, man. It it is. I mean, and so I'm a professor in two different departments. I direct the institute, you know, soon, you know, to to become a department chair, uh, in the community, do this, that, got a family, you know, all of these different things. They they pull at you, you know, and you 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 really gotta find ways to unplug, first of all. This as important as it is, can never be your full life. Because these institutions will drain you and they'll kill you. And they'll go on, they'll have a little morning service for a minute, and then they'll go on like you never existed. You'd be replaced in 60 be, days or yeah. less. So you can't let a place like this just use you up and suck you dry. You know, but that's held in tension with there are so few of us here, right? There's so few of us who get out of where we come from to get access to the space, even to be in the seats that y'all sit in as students. And even fewer is gonna be in a place like mine, right? And, and that's 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 the that's the the evil of it all, if I, you know, it, it is that the reason why I wrote wear so many hats is because there's so few people to distribute the hats to. If we add 100 black faculty members in the College of Arts and Sciences, I ain't got to wear but one hat. But we don't. So now I got to wear six. So everybody got to have their diversity, right? And inclusion and equity. And so now I'm doing this and that, 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 and that. And then they're like, oh, you know, so they say, oh, that's just what you get for being good. I'm like, no, it's not what I get for being good. It's what I get for there not being enough of us here to distribute the responsibilities in the role. But then you gotta figure out like, how do I unplug from that, one, right? How do I, how, it's, 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 we're talking about the burden of the black intellectual, or the burden of anybody who's halfway successful. You know, as a black man, you feel like if you're conscious and you care about your people, like, I gotta put the community on my back. I gotta put this on my back. I gotta do it for us, you know? And we, we do have to do that, but, but also that gets us into, into these, these kind of heroic models of black masculinity where we go on the long range, I'm doing it by myself. Bro, man, we, got, we got to build with people. You know, we got to build community. We got to try to do things collectively and collaboratively. It's not just about, oh, it's all on me. If 
Like, how do I distribute this weight out of a squad, of a team? I think our sisters are often much better at that than we are. You know, to be quite honest, they do much better at the job of that. You know, but I, I think you you, you got to find ways to not let that, that burden of responsibility weigh down on you so heavily. And then in the, in the, even in the, in the biblical type of, you know, this is you, you evoked your life, you know. This is the idea that, you know, I'm the only one out here, you know, that, that you know, I'm the only one who hasn't bowed the knee to bow, you know. And, and God has to come by and say, Elijah's like, look, man, I got a thousand others who are just like you. But we come to think like I'm the only one. I'm unique. I'm yeah. some unicorn. Like, what, 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 it looks like that sometimes. But there's some other people out here that can do the work and, and share the burden. that we got to find and build with them and not become isolated off in our little cave somewhere. Just trying to do it by ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. Want to go far, go together. What's yeah. that guy? What's what's that? What's the professor tell you? Idiot for saying. Uh, Ubuntu. Um. So, uh, in this college journey, college is pretty much, in in, in, in some ways, uh, a micro example of life it's a lot of different people in one setting the pwi it sounds weird but it's a lot of different people in a from diverse places in one setting at the same time driving towards the same thing in a very short amount of time three four four five years um and for us as fellas that's in this room um this is what some of y'all classes probably look like if you take out everybody else and just put the black faces in this class <laughs> That's what it ain't, it ain't too big of us, right? Um, and Jay-Z had a line years ago, a 2009 album that kind of bounced back on, um, where it says, uh, somebody said it ain't, the, the further I go, it ain't many of us. It's actually on a Drake album, a pound cake. Uh, the further I go, it ain't many of us. I look around and say, it's plenty of us. Because he supposed to be in a position of success and you get more and more success. You reach back, not to, you know, give pity, but to give somebody the opportunity to flex their gift in a sustainable way, right? If I know, Carl, you're going to be the finance man. I need my taxes done. I ain't the only person who need their taxes done. And, hey, but man, Carl got me together in six days or less. Got my refund back in 20 days. Everybody go call, right? And then in turn, you know somebody, a brother that's maybe a dentist or whatever it is, work on cars, cut her, whatever. Um, somebody's in the angel investor, you know, but we put each other in repetitive cycles of success over and over and over. Uh, that ain't just getting money and uh, attaining wealth. Sometimes that's going to be, hey, you kind of, man, somehow let me with, with my OG kind of natural for a second, man. We got to get your head in the right space, right? Come holler at, at Brother Odell in the counseling center, man. I just want you to meet me, brother, so we can. And that's going together. So we can ultimately be, be stronger together. Uh, you have some, bro? Oh, yeah, I had a small question. Because, like, you mentioned that you went to Vanderbilt for yeah. graduate school. And, like, that's one of the schools I actually want to go to. Yeah. And, like, I was wondering, like, other than, like, the counseling center and stuff like that, like, how did you actually build communities since, like, a school like that, you know, there's not very many black students that's going to be in your class. But then, like, some of the faculty in the area I want to go into is basically like no black faculty. Yeah, so I was wondering like that's that's a difficult situation. Unfortunately, I I was incredibly lucky in that regard. That which is which is why I I, I had no interest in going to Vanderbilt because it was Vanderbilt. You know, I had other interests like I I wanted a graduate department of religion that uh, was connected to a divinity school. But that that's another conversation. There were only a few, a handful of those schools, Vanderbilt, Duke, Emory, Yale, Harvard. They were all like elite schools. So I didn't want to go to elite school because it was elite school. I wanted to go because it had the kind of programs that I was looking for. And then as I surveyed those, there maybe there's, there's 10 of them. I was like, Vanderbilt by far and away has the most black faculty of any graduate department of religion of the ones I'm interested in. I want to go there. So I was intentional. I want to go where black faculty are. And then when I got there, like, there were like 
12 or to 15 of us black PhD students. Okay, that's so rare. So rare. There was like 12 to 15 black PhD students, and then that's not including all the master students. There's like, you know, like 30, 40 more of those, and we were close, right? Um, so we had an internal, ready built community that Victor Anderson helped to even cultivate even more. Right, we'll create social opportunities for us to gather and talk about ideas. And so he was intentional about creating community among the graduate students. But even outside of that, there were a couple of other things. There was the Bishop Joseph Johnson Black Cultural Center. So there's a cultural center, but it wasn't just cultural center as a broad umbrella, and that's, I appreciate that. But it was specifically the Black Cultural Center, uh, the house, right? And so that was a gathering space for black students undergraduate and graduate across the entire university so like if you want to so even even with our black community within the gdr we go over to the, the black cultural center and get more of it and brother that was running that frank dobson was very good very conscious brother we appreciated him and then they have what was called at, at the graduate level they call it was called ob gaps which was the office of black graduate and professional students so then that brought all the black graduate students together across all awesome arts and sciences, the medical school, the business school, the law school. And they were really, really serious and committed to creating community. And they would have functions and or, you know, some of them would just be fun. We're going to go out to a movie together. We're going to go bowling together. But some of them would come here and talk about serious issues like that the black graduate students should be concerned about. So you might not have the kind of graduate department of religion experience that I had with the black faculty and students but get over there so that if you go there to the black cultural center Roosevelt Nobles is the, the director now then get in and part of that um OB gaps network and I would say whatever you decide to major in maybe you get a graduate certificate in African American and diaspora studies that connects you into the black faculty over there right then you in Nashville now you got Fisk, now you got TSU, now you got Meharry, right, right down the street. So now you build out and you make community with those folks over there, like find people who are like-minded in those schools. Because Nashville got a big black community. It ain't, in the, it ain't in Vanderbilt, but it's in Nashville. So connect, find the good people over at Fisk and TSU who share similar interests and build your community that way. That's what I would suggest. It'd be a whole road map, bro. Right. A whole bro, road map. Like, an entire that. road map. The key to it is semi, like deductive reasoning. So if I know the answer is an A and B, it's got to be C or D. It exhausts all those possibilities. Yeah. So with that being said, um, the other way of literally going about that, say you're looking at, uh, you know, USC, right? Southern California. And they don't have, it's a similar situation. No black faculty that you're looking for in, in your area of expertise in the study. The next question is, who do I know that's in the community there? Who do I know that may have ties to that university in some way that come in on the back channels, right? Um, and a lot of times, to be frank, like as black folks, we have a history of having to communicate, not communicate, having to navigate that way anyway, right? Uh, I can't be back into my grandfather might come walking for a motor company 40 years ago and ask for a job. He might have to come in with somebody that could vouch for him. You know what I'm saying? And we just have to work our magic that way. Get, they used to call it get your foot in the door. Right? So sometimes that in today's world, that may be sending a cold email like he was doing. That may be a doc, Mr. Brandon, what, uh, who y'all know at University of Florida, who y'all know at Yale or wherever. Right, or even with companies, you know, so exhaust all possibilities and say, Hey, all it takes is one seed to plant a big old oak tree. Just one yeah. seed, I don't know where that came because it, 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 and again, I, I just talking about academic, you know what I'm saying? But let, let's just take Nashville for instance, like where you know, where are you gonna go? go what, what are the institutions in North Nashville, which is where the black community historically has been? Go on over there to the, the Key Line bookstore. That's the black bookstore that sit on the corner on Jefferson Street over there by TSU. 
you can sit in that black bookstore for, for about an hour and you're gonna have all kind of people from the community come through and be like, oh, here's a connect, here's a connect, here's a connect. Church where, right there too. Right. Where's the where's the barbershop? Where's the black barbershop that I need to go up? Because all this kind of in, you know, informal networks of community gonna come to the barbershop. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Where the where the church at? Where the where the church that we should go to? Whether or not you believe what they talk about or not, it's it's community. Where the mosque, whatever it is, you know. Where are those black institutions and communal spaces where, you know, those connections that you need, you know, can be found? You know, go find that. Other questions for our good, our good doctor. Um, search for a grab program. Search for a grab program. I think you just got to find, like, you know, what's, what's your real passion, you know, that you really, really want to work on? I mean, for those of us who are really interested and committed to black people, hopefully it'll always be something that's tied back to us. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, I'm not saying that you got to go get a, a graduate degree in, in an African-American studies program. It would be great if you did. But you, you, there, there might be really something that you're passionate about and it connects with, with, with black interests and needs. So, I mean, we need black engineers. We need, you know, black doctors and health care professionals and so on and so forth. So find you somewhere that connects with your passion and the interests and the needs of your community. Find yourself a program that's got some, hopefully, black folk in there somewhere or people who care deeply and invested in your success as a black person, right, that, that's willing to, to work with you and invest with you and help you speak to those needs. That'd be one. And then two, you gotta find a place with some resources too. Now, now as this topic pragmatically, like, what are the fellowships looking like there? You know what I mean? Like, if you if you come out of here with good grades, you know, as a, as a black scholar, there's going to be places where you shouldn't have to pay to go to school, right? You should, they should be paying you. I Look, Vanderbilt costs $40,000 a year. I did not pay Vanderbilt one brown penny to go there. Matter of fact, they paid me. Okay? Who would have known that that was a possibility? I got checked every month from Vanderbilt. Matter of fact, they were like, we want to pay you not to work. So you could just focus on your graduate studies. Who's got those kind of resources, right? As we talk about student debt right now, ballooning it out of control, and they forgiving $10,000 of it, people losing their mind, because they, right, people got hundreds of thousands of dollars of student debt. They got zero dollars of student debt. Okay. Came here on a porter, went there on a fellowship. So that's the difference. It's not just a scholarship, it's a fellowship, which means that they pay your tuition and then they pay you. Where who's got those kinds of resources? And I know, you know, you you sharp enough, you bright enough, find that. Find the best set of resources that you can. Right? It's got the combination of the the disciplinary focus you need. Yeah. The faculty and staff, and don't just look for the big name scholars, you know, like, oh, I want to work with Dr. So and so because he's famous or she's famous. They might be, but they may never be there and they may not be committed at all to their schools. We're going to be the places that got the, the, the resources that you need intellectually and in terms of the faculty and in terms of those those financial resources that, that keep you as far out of debt as possible. And, you know, ideally, this, this guy connects us. I mean, as much as I say I was never looking for an elite school to go to, I'd be lying if I said on the back end, having gone to Vanderbilt has mattered. Right? I ain't even got to open up my mouth. Somebody see on a resume, all oh, you went to Vanderbilt. You know, whatever, I mean, you, you know, like, but it matters. I'm not saying that's the only thing that matters. I think there are great schools out there. I'm not saying you have to have that, but if you can find that too, because these people got networks. Vanderbilt rolled with people who rolled with Duke, who rolled with Emory, who rolled with Yale, who rolled with Princeton, who rolled with Harvard, right? And they're going to put you in those conversations. I got people emailing me right now from IDs, like, oh, so and so said to give you a call. I don't know these people. They know, oh, no, he was trained at Vanderbilt, right? Those are the kind of things that you don't even know about that open up to you in certain choices. You won't have to have that. I, I don't believe that you got to have an Ivy League pedigree. I don't believe in that. But I am saying that, you know, there are good schools like, you know, Ohio State and other places that got deep pockets and UT Austin. 
deep pockets of resources and got large, wide networks. You got to find that. Do your research on those places. And early. Yeah. Find out. Make those calls that I'm talking about. Cold calling people. I'm calling call people all across the country. I'm interested in the doctor program. What can you tell me? Then people who showed interest, I followed up with them, stayed in conversation. You know, there are, there are people who want to help people like you and, and, and let them do it. Last questions? Most of the questions too is that I'm a senior now. Yeah. So you are always back as a little trouble here. And I think you're saying I'm a senior, I want to go to grad school, but didn't necessarily start off the best here. So we talk about GPA, transcript, that kind of thing. Okay. Good. You I don't know if you came in when I told you that I failed <laughs> you know I, mean? I failed the first two tests in I, I Yeah. So I did not move. This is, I'm glad you asked that question. I did not come to the University of Louisville with stellar grades. You know what I mean? Like, and especially my freshman year, I played as Catholic. And I was like, I fell off the map. You know, I was like, man, my grades are terrible. I was like, man, you know, this, this is great, but my GPA is shot. Um, and, I, and it took me forever to pull out of that hole. Um, and even then, you know, it was just, it was good, not great. Then I went, but I got into a master's degree program, and I and I made better of that. Th that positioned me to be able to to have a strong side. So some of it is okay. Like if you're not in position coming out of here to get into the best you know program that you want to, it depends on end game. So like for me, I know PhDs in end game. I got to go through masters to get there. So let me get in a solid master's program, the best one I can get in, and then do my dead level best there because I know better now going into that than I knew when I came here yeah. and let me explain that and then what well, because again Braxton put me up on the game game was that GPA is cool here at Vanderbilt they expect they take it for granted but what really matters is the GRE so no matter how what your GPA is if you knock that GRE out the park they got to take you seriously because they respect the GRE, right? So I buckled down a study that got a great GRE score, right? That was, that had to be taken seriously. Yeah. So, and I remember talking to somebody, they were like, well, we see you did great in your master's program. We see these GRE scores, but like this undergraduate record, you know, tell me about that. And I remember asked somebody asked me straight up and I was like, look, I came in, my parents didn't go to college, I was unfocused, this is what happened. I pledged the fraternity. I just honest with them. Grace dropped, my father dies. It is what it is. You see what came after that. They were like, thanks. I appreciate the honesty. Because we can see with these GRE scores that clearly you can you, you're capable of doing the work here. So I would say now that, that situation's changing a little bit because like there are places where we're saying that we're no longer requiring GREs to get in because they feel like the test of bias and the like. But I still think you can use it to your advantage. Because even though they're not requiring it, you can still take it and blow it up and submit it anyway. And then say in your letter of admission, you know, application, say, look, whatever narrative you want, because you gotta be in control of your narrative too. I understand when you see this GPA, it looks like this. Let me explain this, right? Let me explain this. Now, you can't just be, because then it becomes spin. It's not just spin. Let me explain this and contextualize this. And then let me offer you this GRE as a counterweight, right, to that, to say, clearly I'm capable because I did this over here. So I think you got to use all the tools and resources at your disposal. So what you're going to need, you're going to need a strong letter of application that describes your research interests and gives a clear idea that you know what you want to do when you get there and why you want to go to that particular school and study what you want to do at that particular place. There's a lot of people are applying to schools 
but it's just randomly. Oh, I think this is a good school, so I apply there. No, I, they want to know why Vanderbilt, just for example, like, and what is it about Vanderbilt that you think that you can do here that you can't do at Emory or do or wherever? Like, I want to go to Vanderbilt because y'all do this, and I want to work with this professor and that professor and that professor in order to my end game is that. If you can be really specific like that in a letter of application, you got their attention. And then, hopefully, you build a relationship with some professors who can write you some really good re recommendations. And they then can say, look, the GPA might be this, but in my class, this brother was brilliant. And he asked this kind of question, and he showed this kind of promise. And if you just give him access and entree, I know without a shadow of a doubt that he will perform well, and you will be glad to admit him. Right? That's the kind of letter that you want if you got that kind of background. So you go, you want your 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 letter to be tight. You want your references to be tight. Then you want to go out there and get you another tool, which is that GRE or the the GMAT or the the LSAT or wherever type of grad school that you're going to and blow that out of the water and be like, look, now I want you to read my, don't just read this part of my file, read the whole thing collectively, right? And then you just want to be, put yourself in a position to at least give me an interview, right? Because because if you give, if, if you give me an interview and I, and I get in front of you, then I'm sound, you know what I'm saying? Then, I, then I'm going to convince you that I belong here. But you need at least enough in that packet to be like, to have somebody to say, let's just give them a shot, you know, at an interview. We ain't got to admit them, but let's get them an interview. If you can get that, then you got, then that's your time to shine and seal the deal. Does that make sense? Yeah. Only thing I'll add to that is September. Holler at me. I know you're about to go to the gym in a minute. We can wrap at 4 o'clock today. Anytime after 10 30 tomorrow, and we can build out a checklist of things to consider for grad school, such as where you want to live at. Do you got family there? We're going to pay for you to get back and forth. What's yeah. the insurance look like? Oh, if you got kids, we're going to go through a whole deep checklist of things. And then we'll match that checklist up. We'll cross reference that checklist with cities and schools that fit the bill of what you're trying to do in the next 10 years. Boom. Yeah. They sound perfect. There we go. Um, tomorrow. Anytime after 10.30 tomorrow. Yeah. Pull up on me. Uh, you got something for us? No. Okay. Uh, well, fellas, we going to let the, the good Reverend Doctor get on about his business. Um, dropped a lot of gems, man. Um, please share this. This is going to go up on, on YouTube, on the Coach Center YouTube account. Um, when it gets situated, I'll send it to everybody. Share it a few times. This is what I call evergreen information, meaning it's always going to be in season. And uh, somebody can always use it in a certain message that we can always hear maybe a, a couple times a year. So uh, thank you all for coming out. Thank you, my brother. For thank you. Through. I appreciate Thank you all for watching. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for the question. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Anything I can do, um, I'm over in Strickler, 437. Is my office in the pan African Southern as well. Oh, there it is. We'll catch y'all on the flip side. I'm gonna edit this part, but it's gonna look real cool like this. All right, y'all, take it easy. Hi. <laughs> I guess okay, because I don't even turn the camera off. It's, it's still recording though, man. Yeah, it's going on.